Okay. Um, Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So this is a forum on robotics and control engineering interview series. So uh, Jeff Shama is the department head at the Industrial and Enterprise Systems Engineering at the UIUC Urbana Champaign. Um, I am very honored to have you as uh, my guest today, Jeff. I would like to ask you some general questions followed by research questions, education and some personal questions. And if you are ready, I can start with uh, uh, two general questions. Uh, thanks, thanks for, well, first of all, thanks for having me and uh, thank you, Tanso, for all the things you're doing, uh, you know, for uh, controls uh, in general with your channel and the force lectures and the and the, the YouTube lectures that you're posting. And so thanks for having me and, and thank you for, for everything that you're doing. I, I mean, thanks to you as well. I mean, you are always the, like on these uh, four series. You are always the one of the first ones and not right now these interviews. Thanks for your support as well. All right, so as being one of the role models in the control systems field, what inspired you to pursue a career in this field and how did you get started? OK, uh, so I'd like to say that, you know, ever since I was a child, I was fascinated by you know, uh, autonomy or robotics or space or something like that. And and I can't say that I don't have that kind of uh, story. Uh, a lot of my early educational choices were based on what I disliked the least. And so, so much for the whole role model uh, notion. Uh, <laughs> so when, uh, in going into college, uh, let's say, you know, I wasn't interested in life sciences or humanities, math kind of came easy to me. Uh, so I picked uh, engineering. And so now in going into physics, the first year physics, I really disliked electricity and magnetism. So I went to <laughs> mechanical engineering and mechanical engineering. I didn't care for heat transfer, thermodynamics, materials, and but dynamics and controls was was tolerable. And so that's what I picked in uh, in uh, graduate school. And my first uh, my master's degree was in robotics, actually not dynamics and controls of robotics, but uh, it was something called robot calibration. Mm -hmm. And but that's when I got more exposed to uh, controls and uh, and and actually it was almost a romantic notion that you can uh, you know, get something that you don't understand well to do something that you want uh, through feedback. And so this idea of feedback was was, like I said, magical. And that's when I became obsessed with controls. And, and so I compare my my uh, kind of the early days of getting into controls of kind of backing into it. And now if you go online, you'll, uh, there's a website called feedbackcontrol.com. Uh, there's nothing on that website. But I own it and I own it just because I have to own it. OK, it's it's feedbackcontrol.com yeah. and uh, and just you know my my obsession with controls extends to I need to have that as a trophy uh, oh, my website. Oh, that's nice. Uh, so right now there is no content on the feedbackcontrol.com. There's two sentences. I'll let you look it up and see what <laughs> what it's all, all, all right. <laughs> OK, so how do you maintain a healthy work life balance while pursuing a demanding career in engineering and academia? Like you can talk about your hobbies, any advice to young professionals? So, uh, you know, it's away from the, the office. Uh, family life, of course, keeps me busy. I have a wife and, and four kids ranging in ages from from 10 to 25. And, and so that takes its own time. And uh, in terms of hobbies, uh, one thing that I started very late in life uh, relatively was jujitsu, and I started that about 10 years ago. And uh, and it has a lot of appeal. And so one of the appeals is that I think for people in controls in particular, it's uh, it's a martial art that's that's very appealing in that it's very technical. It involves uh, online optimization. Uh, you could even think of it as a zero sum game if, if that's helpful. <laughs> and then so there's a lot of aspects of jujitsu. I think that's uh, uh, that that appeals to people like us. But then more broadly, uh, there's a there's it's almost a meditative or, 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 or therapeutic quality that's that it's it's pretty much the only thing that I do that takes me away from everything else. Uh, even if I do some other hobby, there might be something like, you know, a paper got rejected and it's still sitting in my uh, head and then gnawing away. Uh, 
Uh, but you can't think about things like papers and proposals when someone's trying to choke you unconscious. And, and that, that has a therapeutic <laughs> value. When, when I'm there, I'm not thinking about anything else. And, uh, and so I really get uh, you know, uh, to enjoy that. Uh, in terms of advice, I have two things to say. Uh, so one is is the caution of taking advice from someone like me, and that uh, and that when I you know my my time and I entered academia in in right around 1990, and just the world has changed and the climate has changed, and what worked for me might not work for someone else. So I think it would be very presumptuous, you know, to give uh, certain advice on you know specific career advice. Uh, however, you know, related to work life balance, I would like to say that that I, I kind of have some pushback on the terminology as though that there's a separation and we're trying to separate two different things. And you know, I think it would apply to you, it would apply to probably anyone who watches this, these videos, is that things that we do in, in work give us a life fulfillment. Like if you're figuring something out for tomorrow's lecture or mm -hmm. reading a paper, either a classic paper or some new things, uh, that's 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 a treat, and to say okay, that's that's not part of my life is is you know it's not quite accurate, and that needs to be offset by a different activity. There are things that we do at work. Yes, there's always tedious things uh, aspects to our work, but there are things that we do at work that are fulfilling uh, in life uh, as well as part of our lives. Uh, that stated, it is important to have something to be able to you know change the channel every now and then. And and so that that's the only advice that uh, that I'll give. But I think that work life balance is uh, uh, for a lot of what we do is, is is a misnomer. Thanks, Jeff. So I would like to transition to research related questions. Uh, the first one is, you know, could you please provide an overview of your current research and what excites excites you the most about it? So uh, in the past few years, I've been working a lot on uh, distributed control or decentralized decision architectures. And so the, the classical picture of a control system is there's the system and then there's one decision maker who is getting all of the information there is to gather and making all of the decisions that there is uh, to make. And uh, now in, uh, in decentralized uh, decision architectures, you have many actors. And uh, we would like to design controllers where not everyone shares all information and not everyone uh, takes uh, uh, has has authority. And so this over the years, it has kind of changed its name, distributed control, large scale systems, cooperative control. It continues, uh, I think, to, to <laughs> fascinate me. Yeah. And and one of the more uh, one of the aspects that's uh, fascinating as well is that as a that not all of the actors are programmable devices. And so now we have devices interacting with, with humans. And then I could talk a bit more about that, but that's another aspect of designing control systems where there's many actors and then mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be uh, uh, interacting with humans. If I would elaborate on that just a bit right now. Uh, so there are some, some recent uh, papers uh, that have shown how uh, humans can exploit algorithms and so for example in ride sharing uh, there's this notion of surge pricing uh, mm -hmm. when there's a shortage of drivers that uh, that the prices go up so drivers can now band together create an artificial shortage drive the prices up and <laughs> then uh, and, and then uh, take advantage of that on the flip side there is a very recent uh, paper that was in the even the popular press in the last year on how pricing algorithms uh, can learn to collude with each other so they're not so they're not due collusion. They're just built to maximize uh, profit, but they learn to collude with each other to raise uh, <laughs> prices in, in an autonomous way. So you yeah. have humans banding together to exploit algorithms. You have al algorithms that can learn to exploit the humans. And so this this kind of notion of uh, of many decision makers and not all of them under our control, I think, is is really fascinating to me. And and part of that is is I've gained a uh, a lot of interest in game theory, which seeks to understand exactly such things of, of the interacting decision makers. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So um, your research, of course, can be tied to a lot of things, game theory, learning. So let's say, suppose you had the ability to use your expertise in control systems to address one of today's major global issues. Which issue would you choose and how do you approach it? There's a, 
actually, I'm going to pass the question to a, a recent document. Uh, that's a very thorough document. Uh, so the Control Systems Society recently came out with uh, a, uh, um, a publication called something like Control for Society Scale Challenges. Yes, and uh, and uh, I think it's the uh, the uh, the main editors were uh, uh, Anaswamy, Johansson, and Papas, and it talks about things that uh, such as uh, food and water security, smart infrastructure, cybersecurity, and the role that controls can play in in all of these. And so I'm going to hand off your question and direct people if they want a thorough answer. Uh, you know, that's a great place uh, to look. Uh, let me just talk about an aspect of controls that sure. allows such uh, such a uh, you know that maintains or perpetuates the relevance of controls is that there's always new technologies coming out for sensing for actuation for computation for communication and so you know I, I mentioned when I got into controls this magical concept of feedback well there's always opportunities now for new feedback loops and so controls is perpetually relevant in that now technology has enabled certain things and then there'll be feedback loops where there weren't before. They might be constructive, they might be destructive, but understanding mm -hmm. feedback I think is, is an important aspect of that. Uh, one thing a little bit on the negative side, when I, uh, I got my PhD, my host for my very first faculty uh, interview was telling me how controls is dead and it's time to cut out the fat and, and um, I'm quoting here. He said the uh, as a new graduate, you're part of the fat <laughs> that you need, needs to be cut. Uh, I didn't get the job, by the way. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, controls, you know, so people have been saying controls is dead, but if we think about it in terms of feedback uh, and and new feedback loops, whether it's between machines or humans, uh, you know, there will always be opportunities for controls to be uh, relevant. Thanks, Jeff. So I would like to shift gears a little bit to the education side. Um, and based on your um, significant expertise in the field, what advice would you give to young professionals who are, who are looking to make a lasting impact on their students, on controls field, education as a whole? So uh, let me rephrase the advice to uh, just some some lessons I can kind of learned over the years and maybe you know the hard way and, and I should have learned sure. them I think the sooner rather than later. Uh, one is to to regularly connect to what's motivating the topic and uh, to always be touching to that magical element of feedback and what it can do. And so there's we tend to I tend to uh, fall on into these kind of logical order of, of exposition. Let's do a review of Laplace transforms, mm -hmm. OK? Or let's do a review of uh, linear algebra before mm -hmm. before we get into you know how we're going to to use it. And in the recent years, I've kind of restructured that entirely to you know, there's a. We start with the motivation of why this is relevant back to you know the the intended utilization and then take a detour, see what we need to 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 fill that and then move on. So you can think that we, I, I kind of introduce concepts in an on demand uh, sort of way rather than a let's do the prerequisites, cover cover the uh, that material and then move into the material of this course. And and I hope that students find it more satisfying. I'm, I'm certainly finding it more satisfying over the years. I've developed a shorter attention span. And so I just can't do a four week review of this or that before getting into the, the material. I need to remind myself of, of you know, keep myself excited in the lecture. So I think that's this one one thing uh, lesson learned uh, over the years. Uh, so that's with classroom instruction. I think and a lot of what we do as faculty is, of course, uh, supervision and mentorship of, of students. And I think that it's it's important to remember that. Uh, that at a university, we, we are at a university and our mission is education and one type of education is research. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a, a contrary opinion. Our goal is not the research. It's research and to the extent that it supports education. And it's easy to get caught up in. OK, we uh, we submit many proposals. We finally got some funded. These proposals have deliverables. We're chasing these uh, deliverables, chasing these deadlines and then get this perception that that the uh, the student is working for the advisor 
and not vice versa or not with the advisor. It's it's important to think about this as a collaboration. And, and yes, that can put deliverables in jeopardy, but the deliverable is the education. It's not the, the annual progress report you know, to the uh, to the sponsor. And, and so remembering that I was very fortunate with my own PhD advisor, uh, Michael Athens, uh, to uh, kind of uh, have that experience and in, in, in working with him. Uh, it's something that I could have done better earlier in my career uh, than later. Uh, and, and so I think that's another uh, lesson learned uh, over the years for me. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, now, I would like to talk with you about, you know, before COVID, we were doing some distance learning, uh, but after COVID right now, right, this distance learning, um, I never posted any recorded mm -hmm. lectures before COVID, but, you know, uh, we did. Uh, now everything like turned back to normal, more or less. But there is a demand from the students. Are you going, still going to make the online lectures available? Now we have all these AI tools, chat GBT and everything. So, I mean, all this craziness. Um, how do you envision the future of classroom in teaching or the role of professors, instructors, mm -hmm. students. What is your opinion? Uh, so as you mentioned, there were these things that were happening before the pandemic with MOOCs and flipped classrooms. All of that discussion was happening and the pandemic kind of accelerated uh, the, uh, that, those, uh, those discussions and that we had to do something uh, a lot more, a lot faster. But if we rewind the clock just a bit, so, you know, you uh, uh, my PhD advisor, Mike Athens, created several VHS lectures on uh, on uh, optimal control. And so these ideas had been around. And I was at a, uh, a workshop at MIT recently where the presenter showed a, a quote from the president's report, where, where it was saying, we have this disruptive technology. It's not clear how it's going to impact education. And the disruptive technology they were talking about was television. OK, so these <laughs> ideas of, of, tele, of, of technology disrupting education have been around. That stated, we're on the other side of the pandemic now and people have different expectations. Uh, it's easy to say that that, uh, OK, in person is better than virtual or remote, but but is it really okay? like I'm going now, why am I in this crowded lecture room sitting in the back taking low notes like it's 1980 uh, where I could have the, the luxury of seeing this pause rewind uh seeing it at my own seeing it when i'm awake um and and and, and re-watching it why can't i have the opportunity to see lectures uh by uh, you know renowned uh people in our uh, community i think we can all benefit uh, from that uh i think there's a rush to say face to face is better than than remote and so there's a lot of uh, and also we're not really using the technology this is changing uh over the uh, very rapidly, but we're not really using the technology uh, that the digital media uh, offers. Uh, pointing a camera at uh, at a lecturer is not is not exploiting you know what what this medium has to offer. So we're just still you know kind of wading into that uh, territory, and I, I think that it will change. One area where I think it's for controls that that deserves a lot of discussion is with labs. And so again, people say mm -hmm. that uh, you know labs are, are need to be physical, and there's always something that you it's hard to uh, capture of seeing something move in front of you. Uh, but if we think of things like like inverted pendulum, why why is it there? We need something that touches on the real world but can fit on a desktop. Okay, and and that was a constraint. Now with virtual environments, we can create a virtual simulation like a full flight simulator uh, sure. and design a controller for a, you know, a full aircraft. And that, and that virtual system will be more real world than the real world system that we have on our uh, uh, workbench. And so I think there's an opportunity that hasn't been explored uh, sufficiently of, of how to really fully utilize uh, virtual and augmented reality in, in labs and, uh, as well. As for you know, other technologies and like like ChatGPT, uh, a lot of the discussion when it first came out was, oh, what are we going to do? Uh, students will use it in this way or that way, and really the the uh, you know if if we're threatened by such a technology, then then we will go extinct. Uh, we need to really think about now that it's here and it's a reality and it will only evolve. How does that change what we do in our classes? 
not mm -hmm. how can we limit or curb its its uh, utilization. But as I said, you know, these questions have been coming out year over year. When we get more computational power, we need to think about our curricula. Uh, I'll tell a personal story. Uh, they uh, so both of my parents were professors, actually math professors, and then so uh, I was taking as a uh, undergraduate differential equations, and it was one of those differential equations classes where here it is, what's the solution? Here it is, what's the solution? And I was getting a little too arrogant about you know, how I'm acing this class. So then my father gave me this book it called Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations. And he said, you can't solve one problem in this book. OK, and uh, he was right. I couldn't solve one problem. In this book. And it was not about what's the solution you have. You know, with computationally, we can kind of derive solutions, but it was about qualitative understanding and insight and, and how differential equations are used. And when we have kind of this uh, technologies that can displace you know, some of the things that we were teaching, then we need to think hard about what are we going to talk about otherwise? And if we have nothing to talk about otherwise, then, then so be it. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then maybe we are uh, irrelevant. But if that's not the case, then, then you know, now like uh, root locus or, or body plots or, or deriving solutions, these are things that we do in controls classes. Do we really want to teach the fine details or do we want to think about the insights you know, and then let let the you know, computation do its thing? And so it's not it's not specific to jet chat GPT. However, I that agree. is, of course, uh, you know, just a, a, a whole new dimension that we've considered before. But this phenomenon uh, you know, of, of technology and its disruption to education is one that's been around. Thanks, Jeff. So um... I would like to move to several, uh, a couple of personal questions. The first one is, uh, could you please share a memorable experience uh, you have had with a mentor, colleague or student that has a lasting impression on you and on your work? Mm, there are several actually. Sure. Uh, several and, uh, and most of them are positive. Uh, to be very honest, there are some negative ones that also had a lasting impression <laughs> uh, on my work. Uh, so just sticking with the positive, uh, I was very lucky you know, early on in, in my uh, PhD and, and early academic career to have uh, either collaborators or mentors like my PhD advisor, Mike Athens, on my PhD committee, Sanjoy Mitter, who sadly uh, passed away earlier uh, this week. Um, Munzer Dahli was my postdoc advisor. Kamishwar Pula was a, a mentor. Uh, Alan Tannenbaum, Trifon, and Giorgio, they were both professors when I got my very first uh, position. And, and as I mentioned, you know, when we were talking about uh, work-life balance and the need to change the channels, there are times that we all face in academia where you just get a few rejections in a row and you feel like you can't do anything right. And, and each of those individuals just said the right thing at the right time. And as that saying goes, I don't remember you know, what they said, but I remember how it made me feel. And getting that kind of encouragement really you know, lifts you and, and carries you for uh, at the moment and for you know, years to come. And then so I was very fortunate to have benefited uh, from being surrounded by people like that. And I'll say also, maybe this is another piece of advice. I took it for granted because everywhere <laughs> I'd been, I had colleagues like that, and it's not something that one can take for granted, and one can be uh, kind of isolated and 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 not have that uh, around them. So it's not something to be taken for granted. If you have it, cherish it uh, because it's it's uh, it's not always there. Uh, as for the negative, uh, you know, I won't mention any specific incidents or names, but I, it has a lasting impression, and I've just learned, you know, don't Jeff, don't do that <laughs> when, when when you're in a similar position. Thanks, Jeff. So um, this is more like a YouTube type of a question. So uh, if you could collaborate with any famous scientist, engineer from history, uh, who would it be and why? Mm -hmm. So now I'm at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Just before this, I was at a place called KAUST, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And uh, they had a science museum where they had um, exhibits many of the uh, scholars from uh, uh, from the uh, the golden age of Islamic uh, scholarship mm -hmm. and uh, the House of Wisdom. So there was one in particular that shame on me for not knowing who he was named Al Jazeera. 
And you can say that Al Jazeera was the first roboticist. Okay, he was a scholar and inventor who lived in Mesopotamia around the 12th century, and uh, and they had you know replicas of some of his inventions. He's not a household name, uh, and he's not even a household name for people who are in in our field. I think I would be fascinated to have a collaboration uh, with with such an individual. I do have a condition though, and the <laughs> condition is that I don't go back in time. But Al Jazeera comes to our time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One is I'm just would like to see what such a what a creative mind would do uh, with the technology that we have. Totally. And the second is I'm just too used to you know modern conveniences like internet and air conditioning. So <laughs> Al Jazeera <laughs> needs to come here. A good deal. So Jeff, last question is: um, If you could give your younger self one piece of advice. Uh, what would it be and why? Uh, here, actually, I'll, I'll quote my first jujitsu instructor from 10 years ago, something he used to say to his students about jujitsu, and I think it applies to many facets of life. And it was don't get tired. OK, so one of the premises of jujitsu is that you don't use force in a way where it's not most effective. OK, mm -hmm. and, and so if you're just in a tug of war, if someone's stronger than you, then you're going to lose that uh, that tug of war. And so this idea of don't get tired, I think, applies to to academia. And sometimes we put in a lot of energy on where it's not effective force and energy. So what would be some examples? Um, say I'm formulating a problem and I'm making it unnecessarily complicated for the sake of generality. Mm -hmm. OK. You know that that's going to get me tired. Don't get that's tired. True. Just focus on the core of the thing. Uh, something related to memorable experiences. Uh, don't spend energy trying to explain the importance of your work to a senior person just to gain their approval. I mean, the <laughs> right people will get it. All right, and so don't get tired. Uh, uh, don't try to cram in material at the end of a semester because we need to, you know, say that we covered it when we're not really covering it uh, in sure. the end. It's just going to get me tired and it's going to get other people tired. I think don't get tired is I a like way it. of life. I like okay. it. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. When you explain more, I mean, I like it. I mean, when you first said don't get tired, but well, but when you explain, it makes all sense. So, uh, Jeff, I want to express my gratitude for your time and uh, sharing your responses with me. And um, thanks so much. No, uh, thanks again for, for reaching out. Think of me and, and thanks for all that you're doing for the community. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Jeff.